Hello, and welcome to Jason Cabinets Experience. I'm your host, Jason Cabinets. Here at Cabinets Here Show, we're doing a crowdfunding campaign that ends next week. Please check it out and support it at https cabinetshr.co slash crowdfunding. Our guest today is Rhonda, Randa Mikara. Randa, are you ready to be great today? I hope so. <laughs> Randa is a dynamic executive leader advancing the media industry through a background in technology, technology broadcast, digital mobile. She combines extensive sales, management, and business development experience with an exceptional ability to drive growth, revenue, and profit by, by implementing innovative solutions. She has successfully led strategic planning, budgeting, operations, product development, and has launched new revenue streams, new revenue streams, and has executed, executed upon multi-platform initiatives for both traditional and digital media properties. Thanks for being here today. I really appreciate it. Absolutely. Happy to be here. So first off, what is the difference between traditional and digital media? Is that like old and new media? Yeah, very okay. much old and new media. I mean, you know, I hate to say back in the day, but I don't. But, you know, I, I started off my career in media, in sales, selling advertising time, right? Just traditional advertising time, which is time on television and, or time on radio. And then digital came along. And it was great and new, and we all launched our websites, and we had digital inventory that we needed to sell. Well, all the teams needed to learn how to do that. And uh, that was not quite so easy, in part because the value of it was so low as compared to the value of selling a television spot itself. So thinking about the average of a news you know, cost for one 30-second spot was somewhere around between five and $700. And we're selling. That's a lot of money back then, wasn't it? It's a lot of money. And we're selling, you know, digital ads and, and looking at the CPMs that we were getting, it was really like nothing, like, you know, a hundred bucks at, at the beginning. So it was really, really tough to have salespeople want to take their time to spend, to spend time to do that. So we, we had to get pretty creative. Of course, now the playing field is leveled. You see more business in digital than you do in traditional and things have changed. So. Has there ever been a challenge like people are quote unquote the old old media catch up the new media? I, 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 you know, as, as, catch up? as far as like you know, like, I think a lot of people and I and I could be wrong. Like you know, people like read newspapers, TV ads. Like oh, I'm gonna spend like ten thousand dollars on a TV ad mm -hmm. instead of maybe dividing the ten thousand dollars and maybe do Facebook ads or Google ads or something like on TikTok ads. Yeah, well, that I mean, there's a really good ROI on all of this. And what I will say is, every bit of it has its place in today's marketing plan. Facebook is targeted, as you've already said, so is Google. And when we started selling digital time, that really wasn't there yet. And certainly not to the degree of targeting availability that we have today. And if you're gonna spend $10,000, you're probably not gonna buy a television ad schedule because it's really not enough money to make impact. But what I will say is that Facebook and Google are great for small to medium businesses that really don't have the budget to reach mass audience. And they also probably don't have as much need to reach a mass audience, right? They're just, they're smaller. Um, but I, you see Google advertising on television, you see Amazon all over television. So a lot of the new entrants into the digital technical world do advertise on TV. Why? Because it is the most effective medium to reach a mass period. End of story. What was the time when Amazon didn't advertise on TV? It's been quite a while that they have. I mean, certainly when they first began, no, they did not advertise on television when they were just simply the bookseller. As they got more third-party vendors to work with them and they were reselling and then they started selling their own and became the giant that they are today, that's when they recognized that they had the early adopters. They had to go get the rest of the world to agree that signing up for Prime was the way to go. And they've done a masterful job of that. So we're going to talk about your company in more detail in a minute. But first, can you talk about some of the tech behind it? Because like it seems like you're trying to uh, combine media with AI, which I think is an interesting concept. Yes, we are definitely combining media with AI. And it is one of the huge industries that's out there that does a lot on gut. You know, almost every other industry out there has some sort of acknowledgement, trackability, and, and a deep use of data in order to make decisions, to drive decision making. And media still does a lot of hunch. And when I was at Fisher Communications, I had a great role, uh, an unusual role, but very, very um, comprehensive in that I was responsible for revenue, but I was also 
driving the digital side directly. That was my responsibility, all of our digital properties. And I was also doing digital subchannel launches and I was doing programming acquisition for all of our stations. Yeah, you're kind of getting the gist. It was like a big job. And then I was doing directly all of the negotiation for carriage. Why does this matter? Because I called research, who else, corporate research, who reported to me as well. And I said, look, there's got to be a way to do this differently. There's got to be a mathematical approach that we can apply. How much should I pay for a program? Where should it actually run? How should we really promote it so that we can optimize the revenues on the other end? Right? Because I was responsible for the whole kit and caboodle. There must be a way to do this differently. He said, okay, let me work on it. Took him a month. He called me back. He's like, I'm so excited of everything you want. I'm like, wow, we're going to change the way we do this industry, right? We're going to, we're going to do this differently. I'm so excited. And he says, I'm emailing it right now. So I open it up. We're on the phone together. And I look at it and I'm like, oh my God, what is this? What is this? And he said, well, this is what you asked for. And I said, no. And it was an Excel spreadsheet with 25 tabs. I am not kidding you. <laughs> I mean, like so many rows of data it was ridiculous. And I said, you know, I asked you for insight and you just gave me more data. Like, blah. Yeah. Like, you know, and he said, well, Randa, to be fair, your answer's in there somewhere. I'm like, dude, seriously? What? Right. Your answer's in there somewhere. I'm like, I don't have time for this. I do five <laughs> jobs. I don't have time for this. So I kind of abandoned it. That's and, hilarious. Yeah. Right. I mean, like, what am I going to do? Nothing. And we, we just went on and the company was eventually uh, bought by Sinclair and I had an opportunity to stay, but I wanted to, I wanted to make what I, the problem that I had in the industry was everything was siloed. So I wanted to find a solution and I knew we were going to have to build it. And then a CEO that I knew who's a friend um, introduced me to my co-founder, Tom Sciarella, and his background is in computer science, actually rocket science. Um, but he's very well versed in startups. He'd done one, he exited and, you know, I, it, he listened to the thought and he said, that's a great idea. There's nobody doing it. So that's the genesis of, of Resonance AI, the company. Uh, we've been around for about six years. We're small. We've spent, you know, we've raised capital and we've spent almost all of our money in development and non-recurring engineering. We've been very lucky to have some customers willing to work with us, to allow us to build and, you know, share with them outcomes. What we're doing is, is taking video, any original content. We have a platform, you run it through and it distills for you the essential elements. And unlike what, you know, Microsoft has MVI and Google has, et cetera, all of those out there, they just define objects. Well, we're not interested in objects because we know that that's not actionable on the other end. So what we're doing is pulling together, we tie it with second by second performance data, whether it's first party um, app data or it is we use TiVo. TiVo's a partner with us and we use TiVo data on a second by second basis to really find out what works, what resonates with the audience. That's why it's resonance AI. And we're able to distill that down into actionable insights delivered in just a seamless and easy to understand UI. Is any platform that you can't work with, like is, is it Twitch, YouTube, Every social media platform? We could work with any social media platform. It's, it really comes down to what they need us to do. Our goals with the company are, are primarily to grow audience, secondarily to save costs along the way, and thirdly, to mitigate risk. Those are the three things that we do. That's all we do. So back to the AI deep learning and machine learning, you know, there's a lot of hot buzz wars lately. Mm -hmm. But I really don't think a lot of people really know what it is, right? Can you get like a quick down or dirty what that means, what it does? What it means is we are training AI for specific video. We're training the, the machine is learning as it goes along. So when we have a new customer, like right now we're working with the Weather Channel, and what we do is we pull in video that they want us to do analysis on into the platform. And then the platform, the first time through, it takes a little bit longer because it's got to learn the faces, the names, the, what we're looking for. So what we've done is we've developed code books very, very specific to the media that we're, we're looking at, that we're doing the analysis on. And this is really critical and a big differentiator for us from other companies out there. You know, if you upload something into recognition, it's recognition. That's it. For us, we've got a specific code book. Is it news? Is it a movie? Is it a series? You think about that, how the AI looks at that content and understands what it is determining 
is really important in advance. So once we've run the video through and we've pulled, you know, the platform will pull in the TiVo data, we're doing millions of calculations on all of that information so that we can discern what really works. I know it sounds black box and to some extent it kind of is, but it's it's math, folks. It's just it's 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 looking at the same data millions of times over and, and changing a single variable so that we can then recalculate and then the platform will determine what rises to the top, sort of what the cream is, what is what is meaningful inside of this. And I mean a simple example I can give is if you're thinking is, you know, we say that our AI watches video like a human does. And if you are watching a piece of video, you're looking. I don't know, that could be a good or bad thing, watching like a human. <laughs> well, but you're, you, it's not what a machine does. And yeah. so it has to learn each time we, we have a new um, attribute that we want to try, then, the, then it's learning that. It has to learn that. And the way it, the machine learns that is by processing millions of videos in order to say, I can recognize it. So one of the things that we've developed inside of our AI is a way to recognize a character anywhere. And why does that matter? Well, if you look at most software out there, most platforms out there where you're doing video analysis, if that character puts on a costume, it's lost. If that character moves from the front of the screen to the back of the screen, it's lost. Our AI, because we train it specifically to that person can just can anywhere, anywhere on the screen, any costume, sunglasses, hats. If you think about like a Johnny Depp, um, Edward Scissorhands, he looks very different than in any other movie, right? Yes. Our AI can immediately say that's Johnny Depp anywhere he is or any other character. So that's a defining principle inside or, the, you know, the unique qualities that, that our AI has that you won't find elsewhere. This, this trips up a lot of AI. It trips it up because the machine has not really done the deep learning. And what we're doing is mapping that character, right? Obviously, the AI is mapping the character. And that's how we know where it is. So a totally random question. It might be off the wall. Does the AI say, okay, at this point, the human will go take a snack or take a break and stop watching the TV? No, we are not actually, we're not doing that. Okay. What, what we are looking at is the behavior of that device. So this is device level. Okay. And, you know, it, it, we're looking, let's, let's talk about news for a minute. It's a very different animal near and dear to my heart. Um, with a newscast, we're looking at, did that same household come back, that same device come back? Did they watch your competitor's news? Did they watch you three days out of five? Did they go somewhere else? When we look at um, other content, um, did they binge one or three at a time? How, how much did they binge of your content? Did they not binge at all? How bingeable is this content? Um, did, the, did the device come in at episode three and did it go back and pick up one and two or was that completely skipped? So there's a lot of analysis that we can do on the behavior of, of devices. Obviously, we don't have PII. We, if we randomly assign numbers to it so that we keep it confidential. We don't even know who it is, but we're really interested in, in, in pulling together what I would call the actolytes. You know, what, what is happening with your content? If 700 devices turn it off at one point, that's meaningful. That's what the, what, that's what the machine learning is pulling through, is, is, is tying together all of that information. It's massive amounts of data. And then from it, extracting only those things that are meaningful and measurable that the, all of the algorithms have determined are, are really actionable and important. We, everything else just gets tossed aside. So who's your customer? Like, who are you selling this to? We sell this to studios, to networks, to broadcasters. Uh, we are looking eventually to get into the ad side. We had, um, Someone approaches a company approaches about doing analysis on their um, advertisements themselves, their video, and would like to get to the point of predictability. So that's something that we are designing right now. We're working through the, the parameters of that right now. So I think it's no fact there's like a, a deficit of software developers. I think there's like 120,000 like empty software developer jobs. I'm guessing that it's even harder to find an AI developer. 
We have not had that situation. Okay. We good. have a brilliant data science team and of course the engineering side as well. Um, one of the things that we make very, very sure is that we give people equity. Every single person in our company is an owner and it's not right otherwise. It's a startup. No, it's not. It's just very wrong. <laughs> it is very wrong. It is very wrong. So we've made sure to include our employees in a meaningful way in equity. And each year you stay, you get more equity. Um, they are, it's been important to us to create a company that works the way we believe companies should. For instance, we had a, before COVID, um, a work from home option on Fridays. Mm -hmm. Fortuitously, that meant that everybody was already set up when this happened. And we said, individually, come grab your stuff and take it all home. And if you don't have the office support at your house, then we will fund that as well. So we bought people chairs and, you know, whatever they needed to be comfortable working from home. And all your people work and live in the Seattle area? Yeah, they do. Yeah, yeah. Um, at this point, we will, one of these days, expand hopefully into L.A. and New York. <laughs> It's on our roadmap, but everything really got sidelined by COVID. Everything. Yeah. So and I could be wrong again, but you're a media company. And it's like a lot of media comes to an LA and New York City. Why why Seattle? Is because you live here or is there why well, has there been any disadvantage or advantages of being in like a quote unquote a non-media city? Um, I would say there it's it's both ways. I would say in terms of the the skill set for the developers and data scientists that we need. This is a great market. Yeah. You know, yeah. just great. Um, you're right. From the media point of view, it is a bit of a limitation. And is it possible that we could be farther along if we had offices in those places? Yes. Definitively. Yes. But we're, we were just launching that and COVID hit. So. So next, let's talk about the, you, you, you have a big role, I believe it's called WTIA. It's like Washington Technological Institute Association. Yeah, Industry and Association. Can you talk about your role with that or why that's important to you? Yeah, um, I have always admired WTIA. Um, my husband actually worked at a number of startups and I, I was introduced to WTIA through that. And I thought that it was a great organization. Um, WTIA, I'm on the one of their boards, as you probably guessed or saw, and um, it is on the healthcare board. Their healthcare is so outstanding. The opportunity that WTIA brings to startups is incomparable. What, they're, what they've done is they've cobbled together many, many companies so that we have a group rate with them. And the benefits are terrific, and the price point is affordable, and they know how to work with startups. So they're really evangelizing technology in Washington State. Most recent initiative is DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion. We know that there is an issue inside of technology for this. And we are working together with a whole host of companies out there that have signed a pact to say that they will make changes in the next year or so on their staff. And so we've committed in writing to make sure that our staffs are more diverse. Obviously, that's near and dear to my heart. Um, we work hard to have women on our team, and I, that would be crazy if we didn't. <laughs> um, so that's something else important to us. And I love the work WTIA is doing, advancing technology in this marketplace. So to, back to DII for me. So I retired from Army 2015, got involved in tech 2015, 2016. So I've been involved in Seattle Tech in a few years. And it's like, you know, DEI is always a focus for everyone. But well, based on numbers, that's like the numbers are ever getting better, right? I mean, I could be wrong about that. Is, that, is this going to take, does this take so long? Or why do you think that the problem, the challenge is with improving the numbers? I think that you have to focus on it in a meaningful way. It's really hard to do. And one of the things that we know is you have to reach back and out and into the schools themselves. We know that um, I'm also on the, the chair of the Girl Scout board here. When we think about STEM, we think about girls, not just girls of color, but any girl, you have to be able to see yourself in the role. And that's been a limitation. We also know that girls are very often discouraged from STEM. It, it's just, it's still, it's kind of baked into our society that girls are, are discouraged. Yeah. There's a stat somewhere that says like, I, I'm making this up, but like 80% of girls love STEM in elementary school 
and it drops like 10 percent at high school it's not something ridiculously like exactly, that exactly exactly and i i heard a, a long time ago a few years ago i was driving so i can't even tell you the source of it but i heard um a news story on npr that was talking about how girls are discouraged at a very young age in school it, it this is what we mean by it is engendered it is there in the system but they did an experiment i don't know where with whom or any good details but they did an experiment where they tested girls and boys um, for abilities in STEM. And there was one group that knew who, which student was which, and another group that didn't. And they saw very, very clearly that the teachers still discouraged the girls that scored very, very high. They just still discouraged them, and they encouraged the boys. And so it, it's unconscious bias. I mean, like, yeah, like you have a boy and a girl, the boy gets muddy. Oh, keep on playing, you no know, little Tommy. Right. So go get dirty. So little Susan, what are you doing? You know, go right. get cleaned up and go, you know, play Barbie or, you know, do something, you know. Right. I mean, when I was a little kid, I was a complete tomboy. I'm sure this comes as no shock to you. <laughs> I, I mean, I was always getting cut. And, you know, I wanted to play with trucks and I, my dad was a, a civil engineer. And so I thought I found engineering fascinating. And yet still, I was this good. Yeah. Back to diverse, diverse hiring, uh, a lot of people say, oh, let's do a diverse hire, right? It's, it's not easy, right? First, you got to convince the person to work for you, right? Right. I mean, they got to be qualified, you know, all that kind of stuff, and they're going to want to work for you, right? And if you're like, you have a company with 10 white guys, you know, two, you know, I mean, what you expect, you know? And or, or if you go to the same place all the time, why well, right. hire the last four people from this place? Right. You have to change and expand how you recruit, where you recruit. You have to think about even the language in the posting. Is the language in the posting alienating? You know, there, there are so many aspects to it. And then you're right. You have to have the environment where that person feels welcome and safe and is able to thrive. Yeah, I definitely think startups are a great place as a great opportunity, but I think a lot of people are missing it, right? And I want to say, like, like race on nothing, but like, suppose you have two, two kids. One comes from a single parent, you know, three brothers, you know, you had to work jobs through college. Another kid, you know, two parent back home, uh, back background, middle class. So the kid with a single parent, he has to find a job and you know, take care of home, right? right? right. Where the kid with the two parents, he can take a year off, work for a startup. And then it's like, you know, a kid with a single parent background, a poor economic background, make 80, 90,000 years. It's not bad. You know, that's decent money. But then the other person has the opportunity to make millions of dollars, right? And I don't know how, I don't know how you fix that. Well, you fix it by focusing on it and making a firm commitment to it. But again, you've got to reach kids in school. You've got to go deeper than just, I'm going to post it and hope for the best. <laughs> you know, you've really, you've got to live and breathe it. And one of the things I like about what T WTIA is offering is, you know, for those of us that can't afford a diversity officer, they've hired that. And they are putting together programs and reaching back out to us and teaching us what we need to know. It's really very innovative of them. I don't know if other associations are doing this, but I find that the work is comprehensive and the effort is beyond just speaking about it. There are, you know, call very frequent calls where we are learning and listening. And we all need to do that part also. We all need to learn what we don't know. So DMTI is only it's not only Seattle, it's the whole Seattle Washington, correct? They can yes, it's Washington Technology. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, and they have, don't they have some kind of incubator accelerator they run? They do. They do. Yes. Is that like Techstars YC type thing or? I am not, I'm not deeply informed no. on that. I haven't, we didn't apply for it because we were past the criteria at that point. So, um, you know, all of this information is on their website, but you are absolutely right. They do have an accelerator. I just don't know what the criteria is and what the entire program is. What's the, What's the stereotypical start that goes through the WTIA? Is it, do you have to have a certain amount of revenue? No. Uh, deaths any certain stage? No. As long as they're tech, a tech-based company. Right. You have to be tech-based. And in the state of Washington. And in the state of Washington, and you pay your membership. Okay. And, you know, that that's the criteria. And then the larger you are, the more your dues are, kind of kind of naturally. Yes. Do um, you have to know how many startups are in WTIA right now? I do not. Okay. Uh, next. Um, anything else you want to talk about the WTIA before we move no, on? No, I just, I just think the work is groundbreaking. And I, I, I think that their current CEO um, is just doing a phenomenal job. So, Nick, something else that is near, near to your heart, the Girl Scouts. Yes, 
Love so it. let's talk about the Girl Scouts. <laughs> yes. You're on the board for them too, right? I've been on the board since uh, 2009. I took a year off a couple of years ago because I had to. Were you a Girl Scout growing up? I was a, I was a brownie. So okay. yes, I was a Girl Scout. Okay. Um, and I loved it very much. Um, it taught me a lot of important lessons. It taught me teamwork. That's where I really first learned teamwork. And it also taught me um, about give back, about doing something for others. And that's really where that was instilled for me. Plus, I loved the camaraderie and the learning. i lifelong learner. So for me, that was a lot of fun. Um, but yes, I'm, I've been on the Girl Scout board for quite some time. I was a treasurer for a period of time. I ran the finance committee for many years up until I took over as uh, chair of the board. And the Girl Scout, that's a nonprofit, right? Yes, it is. It's a nonprofit. And is it, is it worldwide or just U.S.? No, it's worldwide. Okay. Yes. Okay. Um, so you have a lot of fun with the Girl Scouts, don't you? Um, I do, but it's a, it's a lot of good work. I yes. mean, actually, I was a brownie in Dubai. I, I oh, lived wow. overseas, yes. So there was a mom who... Oh, but that had to be a little bit different, being a Girl Scout in Dubai. I guess. I don't know. It was the only place I was. I was, yeah. I was very proud. I, I had my outfit and anyway um it was very proud to and it was an, a mom an american mom who was stationed there and she decided to start the troop and it was wonderful um so you have previous sales experience uh, like a you know back in the days you said how has this sales experience helped you with being an entrepreneur and being an investor i would say that sales has helped me in every way you cannot be a, a co-founder of a company if you can't sell you're always selling everybody's always selling at a start you have to know how to do it. You have to be able to accept rejection. And, you know, pe people have talked about this widely. Um, investors say no. And they say no a lot. And they say no with earnest. And sometimes they say no and say things that are so wrong that you're just sitting there with your mouth open. But like, you're did not you just say that? Exactly. I mean, we, we really had one investor say they didn't want to invest in us because they thought that the media and tech, the media sector wasn't a big enough sector in the economy. I'm like, <laughs> what? Like, okay. For me, I think that's dodging a bullet because that's not the right investor. Case, yeah. Right. So sometimes it's a blessing and you have to realize that and you have to have a, you know, sales is I got tons of no's, but I don't care about no. I care about getting the yes. And that's a very different way to approach it. Mm -hmm. You can tell me no three times. I'm each, and the only reason you're telling me no three times is because I keep coming back mm -hmm. and I'll keep coming back until. There's a match. There's yeah. a, a way for us to work together. What's it say? Like, I make this up again, but a nine, it takes 99 no's that get one yes or something like that. Right. The more no's, the closer you get to yes, all that kind of right. stuff. I mean, I can't remember how many people turned down Jeff Bezos. Yeah. It was a phenomenal number of people. And what a shame. What a shame indeed for them. Right. Um, so I'll go back in the day again. Of course, I know I, I, I scoped out your LinkedIn profile. You did an article back on July 3rd, 2019, titled Getting to Market Something Something That Startup is Ridiculously Hard. Yes, it's that product market product. Yeah, fit. that. Yes. And I think that's still relevant today. It is so relevant. Can you talk about that? Yeah, I mean, it's still relevant. I think that one of the dangers in a startup when you have brilliant people, and we have brilliant people, is sometimes people look at the data, look at the potential, and determine that's a direction we should go in when there isn't a market for it or the customer doesn't necessarily, it doesn't necessarily end, um, solve a problem for the customer that's burning. And so there's a lot of iteration. You have to continually iterate and talk to your customers. And you know that was something that we had to learn because we had folks that didn't come from media, but are brilliant and are brilliant engineers, brilliant data scientists say, well, this matters. Well, maybe it doesn't matter to the customer. And so you have this yin yang inside the company of what the customer wants, what the engineers want to build, you know, and, and so that then roadmaps get um, altered and plans get changed and this side of the house doesn't know. Um, so that's, that's really an interesting dynamic. And I would say that I didn't realize how challenging that could be. And what I did to solve it was put myself in, in, the, um, in the process, into the product process, which has been a delight because that was not something I'd really done a lot of on my broadcast side or in my media side. But in this instance, 
it is. And you have to have somebody who's a subject matter expert guiding the engineering along, guiding the development along, being part of that roadmap process. So back to co-founders or founders and doing sales, suppose the co-founder out there and like, I've never done sales. I know how to do it, but I need to do this. Is it a matter of just like doing muscle memory and doing it over and over again, or is they should take some kind of training to like bring on a salesperson? What advice you'd have for that? There needs to be in the beginning, a sales plan. I, you know, so many great ideas, companies are started with founders that have never sold anything. Don't think sales and marketing is a priority. They build this platform. Now what? Are they going to come? Is this field of dreams where they're just going to come? <laughs> Probably <No>. not. <laughs> no, they're not going to come because nobody knows. And if you don't bake it in early into that business plan, I would not, and I am an angel investor, I would not invest in a company that didn't have a sales and marketing plan that I could really wrap my head around early, mm -hmm. right away. You really need to start developing the market and the customers, especially if you're doing something completely groundbreaking where you've got to do two things at the same time. You gotta go, you gotta go teach the marketplace about your product and convince them they need it and then sell it. That's a little different than I'm gonna open up, I don't know, I'm gonna come up with another CMS or I'm gonna come up with another approach to something in medical that, that you know, you, the FDA cleared it and that's awesome. And, and people know what that is. When you walk in and say, hey, I'm AI for media, people are like, I need that? What do I need that for? Well, let me explain. You know, there's too much content coming out. You need, you actually need another tool in your tool belt to help guide your writing, your finances, your marketing. You need that tool today. There's too much competition. I mean, think about the explosion of video production in this country, any country, all over the world. An individual with an iPhone can shoot a movie. Yeah, everyone's an influence. Everyone's a video golfer. Everyone has their own business, social media company. Right. So you really need to know what works before you spend vast amounts of money and create things that the market goes, meh, I don't care, you know? And, and, and there, are, there are really good examples of series that have changed their writing style or changed the way they told the story in different ways, such as moods and pacing and shots per minute and, and the character interaction, and they've lost vast audience well you know you're looking at that as a viewer and you're going to say well i think it's for these reasons you think how about you know and then you the executive you the producer you the editor you make the decision at, at a or b right you're making the decision but it is another tool in your tool belt there's an over reliance on nielsen and other measurement companies to call that performance. So there's that. That's that's what in the marketing world or the advertising world, Nielsen is currency. And the whole way that's gathered is antiquated. The output is interesting. It's imputed. And we've got so many customers now that actually have their own apps. And we can pull OTT data to the second that actually shows you performance in almost, you know, almost real time. Not obviously we need to wait until we, we have the data uploaded to us, but short of that, I mean, you know whether or not that episode was successful. You know how to change your marketing. You know how to proceed. And it's, it's, it's a tool. So I think we had some people scared, oh, we're gonna do right, right copy for us. No, no one's writing any copy for you. There's no substitute for the brilliance of creation that only people can do. We're not trying to do that. We're, we couldn't do that. But we could tell you that at eight o'clock, this, you know, let, let, actually, let's go back to news. I love that example. You know, this story resonates in these markets. Human interest, overcoming adversity, that combination resonates in these markets. In these other markets, maybe it doesn't. We always say markets are different. Now we can show you how. So back to the, the, so it's like everyone says, Hey, startup founder, you know, you gotta do marketing, gotta do sales, you know, don't focus on the product, but time and time again, startup founders focus on product. Yes. Why is that? Is this because they're software engineers and that's what they're comfortable with. They don't want to do sales and marketing. They think someone else will come and fix it for them. Yes. That that's, that's how I see it. Yeah. You know, there is just not a familiarity. And 
again, you you have to hire a CRO very early in the process. Then maybe not necessarily someone you're bringing in as a CRO, but I would try in every case to bring in a co-founder who was revenue facing, who understood the steps and the complexity to create sales in a market that is either not there or somebody who has built something from nothing and figured out how to turn that into sustainable revenue. I mean, for my my career, I went to a startup radio station. We literally had nothing. We just flipped the switch, right? And it's like, go sell something. And I hadn't sold anything before in my entire life. I'm like, I don't really know how to do this. Well, spots are $8. So I go into the customer and I ask them to buy spots and they pay me $8 a spot. Yep, that's the upshot. Then what? Well, you're, if they don't have an ad produced, you're going to have to write one. Well, it's a little lesson, huh? I did, I did, I did go to the College Conservatory of Music at, in Cincinnati, uh, and they had a broadcast division, and I got a degree in it, so I actually did know how to write copy. But, you know, that's a little shocking to somebody that didn't. Um, so, yeah, that's where I learned to sell, and then I went to a startup TV station, and it, was a Fo- it became a Fox affiliate pretty quickly. It was a blast. I couldn't believe anybody paid me to do it. It was so much fun. So your, your company had a name change recently, right? Yep. We Can did. you talk about the old name was Transform, I think? Yep. Can you Transform. talk about the reason for the name change? Was just a branding reason or something more deep than that? Just totally random. No, it wasn't totally random. It was really customer driven. Um, quite frankly, we spent a lot of time explaining what Transform was and what Transform did. And there's nothing in there to indicate that we have, you know, AI, deep machine learning, we've been building for six years on video, right? I mean, there's nothing in that name that says that to you. Secondarily, when you go talk to a customer, you have a brand new concept, a brand new idea, a brand new build, a whole new software application, and you show up with a name like Transform, people are like, yeah, I don't want to transform, right? I was like, it's, it's, it's a asking too much. Yeah. So one of our customers can't... I can't tell you which one because he said, well, basically you're just, you're just showing us resonance. I'm like, yeah, we are. And that's a great and idea. Ding, ding, ding. The ding, light bulbs are going ding, off. Ding. And- yeah. Let's, uh, let's trademark that. And so we did. Um, yes. And, and resonance AI, AI, because we are truly AI. And one of the reasons, and we only did that early last year, February, it was February of last year when we, when we, talked to the team and and really made that name change happen. Um, There were so many companies. We said it at the beginning of this. AI is a buzzword. Yeah, it is to most. People started just like slapping it on everything. And we knew it wasn't genuine. And for us to have not had AI in our name meant that we gave away a lot of brand equity, if you will, um, that we shouldn't have. So that was the reason, the genesis for the, the change. Can you talk about the, how you did the rebranding of the company from one name to another? Was that a big deal? Was there a lot of work in that or was this pretty seamless? No, there was a lot of work in it. And there was a lot of advanced work from February. We started working on a new style guide. We had to figure out colors and fonts. And, you know, there was a lot of work. We worked with an outside uh, group to help us do that. And then we uh, narrowed that down. Then there's the, you know, filing for the trademark. Not really hard, but an important element if you want to keep it. And um, then we had to rework all of the internal paperwork. We legally still have the name transformed because I just didn't have the bandwidth really to go through a whole name change. So it's really a doing business as or a DBA, Residence AI. Um, so we had a lot, a lot of internal work, a lot of changing materials. And obviously we we rebuilt the website. We, we we didn't just change the name on things. We rebuilt and and re- recreated everything. So you mentioned Style God. That's the same as the brand book, correct? Yes. yes. Can you talk about the points of having a Style God and brand book as a startup? Um, it, it comes down to the marketing side of it, which is, again, often forgotten. Can you talk about, you know, the fonts, the... The color. That's one thing I learned as a, as a stop entrepreneur. I had no idea n- colors and numbers. Yes, like, they do. I'm like, what, what are you talking about? What yes. are you talking about? I had no clue. I was clueless. Yeah. Yes, they they very much do, and I think I I I've kind of grown up with that because at Fisher, when we changed our logo, it was a gigantic thing, and we were all looking at numbers and colors and and that sort of thing. But 
it's vitally important for consistency. A lack of consistency in the marketplace is a big problem. If you have somebody that takes your logo and decides to, to reverse it and put it, change the color, that's a huge problem. So it, it, we need to build I, you know, that, that identity, if you will, that brand in the marketplace and have it consistent. So we all had to agree, which is like herding cats because not everyone agrees on almost anything. Uh, we did love the logo as soon as we got it. That I will say, there was no argument, no contention. The designer made it. We said, that's, you know, we had a few options. And that, let the, we all agreed on the same one. So that was, that was great. And one of the things about our startup is we, we don't have a, a top-down rule. We have a, as horizontal as we can get it. So everyone had an opinion. And we wanted that opinion. So I will tell you, I lost on something kind of major. I lost on the color palette. Oh, did you? Yes, I did. You had a compromise to this. I, I was outvoted. Yeah. And that's a really important way that we run the company. This is why we have not had an issue hiring and why I think our, our culture is one of inclusion because it goes beyond just Hey, this is this is a color palette. I'll tell you, my co-founder as well didn't really like the color palette. We both lost one day. We're sitting there looking at each other, like maybe yeah, to the side eye, like what's going on right, right? now? Like how do we get here? Like we're the co-founders. What's going on right now? Right, exactly. So we actually have a new um, uh, UI developer who came in and said, you know, I kind of agree. These are a little harsh, and we should tone them down, and let's get some gray in there. And Tom and I were dancing around on, on Zoom because we were so happy to to hear that, you know. It was a little bit saturated mm -hmm. for repetitive use. And I think that was what, you know, if you go to the website, you don't, you don't necessarily see every bit of this color palette every minute when you're doing a PowerPoint and that's your template. After a while, you're like, ouch, it's just so saturated. So anyway, I think we're digressing. I'm sorry. No, no, that's, that's perfect. Yeah. Once okay. my design, like I, I learned I quick, like there's like the design has to be responsive. Might look one way on the iMac, another way on yes. a, Android app or just all these different things you don't think about. You just like front end, back end. It's all just one computer program, right? It is. And the things you learn, right? Yes. And they all have to be right. And so we, we, you know, we know what we're experts in and what we're not experts in. And we hired a website developer who shot video for us as well in, in order to make sure that what we put up there was responsive and did look good everywhere. We have a small team. I can't have, I have one person who's a, um, running content and strategy he can't spend all of his time you know doing this we have to hire out so we are i believe smart enough to know what we know and what we don't know that's another thing you know you know not invented here you have to know what is the most expeditious thing to do do you license it some a component that you need or do you build it all building it all is slow and expensive and i'll just bet marketing and sales is left on the cutting room floor when everything has to be built internally. One of the things that we have done is done that analysis as a team consistently. And there are times where we have said, there is nothing out there that can do this element. We're building it ourselves. And so we have done that whenever we've needed to, but not for every single element of everything that we do, because it doesn't make sense. For instance, you know, we use some visualization tools. We did actually, we're past that now. Uh, we did, we, and the problem was the limitations built into the software. We just couldn't get far enough with putting it in our platform using that visualization tool. So we got to a certain point, we was like building it ourselves, dumping that. And, and, and that I think is a, is a smart way to grow. It's an agile way to grow. It's also very cost-effective financially for using our dollars very effectively and stretching them very, very far. And that's important as well. You don't want to just, you know, here's my funding and I, oh, it's going to be like this forever. And no thought about the next day, no thought about control, controls around cost. So let's say there's three co-founders out there and let's say some, they raise a million dollars in funding and, and they are going to hire some people. What advice would you have for them who to bring us to be like two developers or market person? Like how, how should they like strategize that? It depends on what the co-founders were specialists. 
right? Like I'm very lucky I have a technical co-founder. Obviously I couldn't build an AI company without that. You know, my background is media. Granted, I was considered technical in media. So I had that benefit, but you have to figure out what you're missing. In, in the writing of your business plan, it should become pretty clear what elements you need in order to succeed. And so if you have two co-founders and no one knows sales, then you need to hire sales force. If you have no experience in marketing and branding, then you need to bring someone on. But the preponderance of your of your hiring is going to be around those that are building the product, right? The, the software, I mean, the technology. That's just a given. You've got to attract them as well by letting them know that there's hope. Here's, here's my plan. You know, we're going to build this, and then this is the plan to get it to market, and this is how we see this rolling out, and this is the, you know, three- to five-year plan on revenue, I think, anything past three years is it's not even swag at that point it's, you know you're making that up i know you are um you're going to pivot and you have to have people that have leadership skills that really know how to lead i also see sometimes folks come come into it they've got a great idea they're probably better off as a cto than a ceo you really need some experience in leadership before you do that. Yeah, can you talk about the points of having some kind of leadership training or some kind of leadership skills as a, as a CEO? Um, it is the critical, it is the most important thing that a CEO brings to the table is leadership, is the understanding of how to talk to people, how to care for people, how to, how to show them that you're hearing them, how to actualize what they're saying, and then how to work with the entire company to turn it around and make it happen. So that's a lot in a one sentence, but I think that COVID has shown a lot of people the importance of soft skills. You know, it's become even more important, if you will. I, I mean, agree. We've done, I will tell you, you know, Tom, my co-founder is very smart about this. We, we deliver care packages to their homes and it's a nice touch. Exactly. We yeah. Do. Little things go a long way. Little things go a long way. And right now little things are really critical. In fact, we should really be doing something right now, but you know, for the holidays, we delivered a holiday gift pack that, that we went and bought the stuff and then we, we assembled it and then we delivered it and they knew that um, because you know, you have to do things differently. Now we don't see each other. It's very weird. Um, very, very weird to think about that. We see each other on Zoom. Is that is that a substitute? No, it's not. So talk about the challenges of being an entrepreneur and, and second part of the question. Has being an entrepreneur, entrepreneur changed over the years or being an entrepreneur is, is the same regardless what year it is? Well, I heard a quote somewhere that being an entrepreneur is chewing glass while looking into the chasm. And I thought, wow. That is so true. There is a, I would say, a, a, a continuum. And I think that part of it is over the time that you, you've been doing it, right? Um, it, it's, it's, it is kind of lonely and hard. I would not start a company as the sole founder because you need someone to talk to. You need someone to talk you off the ledge and you need to be able to talk someone else off the ledge. I think that there is investment, but one of the things that has changed in the past year, two years really, you know, they're looking for companies that can thrive in COVID, right? That's the initial or the most interesting right now. And that makes it a little harder for a media technology company to raise funding during COVID at, you know, production stop for a while. That's not good for us. Um, news is good for us, though. News is a good business all the time because there's always news, right? So there's there's ways to be smart and pivot. It's always going to be stressful. You are always going to be worried about money. If you're a person like me, I'm responsible for, you know, I'm the acting CFO. And that means I'm always worried about costs and funding, always. So we're going to talk about you as an investor in a minute. But this is a question I ask everyone. So you, 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 you've you seen a lot of startups through the years, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. Now, everyone says, you know, don't give up, grind, 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 never give up, you know, keep on going, you know, all that kind of stuff. 
there's a time when a startup should say, our founders should say, you know what? This doesn't work for me. And not, not even just that pivot, just like stop altogether. If you have no money to pay your employees, I don't know what you do. Mm -hmm. You can put it in stasis, you can go raise some funds, and you can rehire. Um, the problem is, it's always hard. The problem is you can always have a reason to give up. Doesn't mean you should. I think when, when as founders you get burned out, that's when you should probably either step aside or say, hey, I'm done with this. The other thing you can do is turn it over to someone else. There's a, there's, um, you gotta, I think you gotta be very, very humble to do that though, though, don't you? Like you gotta, have, you gotta have like, get rid of your ego, be humble. Like I'm not the person for this. Let me give it to someone else. Yeah. You have to be humble, but you also have investors that will tell you that at some point along with your board. I'm sure they're influencing you, right? More than that. <laughs> um, you know, there, there are, there are early stage founders and CEOs that are great. And then you start to metamorphosize into running a, com a big company. If that CEO doesn't have that experience, that will be a limitation. Mm -hmm. You know, it just it probably will be. And investors will either understand that the CEO is growing with the role and should remain or that the CEO needs to go. But there are a lot of instances where investors have said, you know, I can think of two right off the top of my head that, that um, the founder should go. And one of them is Jack Dorsey, right, from Twitter. He left. They hired someone else. Didn't work. They brought him back. Yeah. And the most famous, of course, is Steve yeah. Jobs. Right? Most famous one, yeah. Yeah. I mean, you need that evangelism. You need that belief. You need some, a, a leader who can really, really envision the future. And not only that, but motivate everyone to go in that direction. You know, leadership is not putting on the leadership hat, running up the hill and everyone is at the bottom of the hill looking at you. If people are not following you, you're not a leader. I don't care what your title is. It doesn't matter. And, you know, they knew how to inspire. And people stay and work with companies that inspire them. And inspiration and charisma and all of that is so critical. And again, is a soft skill. It goes back to, it goes back to those skills that you learn on the playground, right? You know, either you learned it or you didn't. And do you play well with others? And and, and a lot of people don't play well with others, unfortunately. Exactly. And, but, but they think they do. Yes, that's also terrible. That's also terrible. So off, off the subject, you also have two rescue dogs. I do. So what, what is a rescue dog? Hmm. So... A rescue dog is, a, in my mind, a dog that you get from a shelter or a placement. Okay. Um, so not not a dog that goes to rescue people from the mountains and. No, okay. no, 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 no. Okay. They they are just um you know, my oldest dog Lulu was what we call a re rescue, as is my second dog. Um, what that means is the dog was brought back mm. for some reason, and Lulu was brought back because she was given to a house with a chow chow. You don't do. That. You don't bring another dog into a chow chow house. It just, it's a bad breed for that. Um, so she was returned. When she was returned, she was the um, only female in the litter left. And the male dogs, her own litter, mm. were making things not safe for her. And so we had the opportunity to um, bring her home. And, and, and how long have you had them? I had, Lulu is now 14 and a half. Okay. So I've had her a long time. Um, I don't, it's the dog choice in my world. And so Lulu, when they took out the check, she's a little tiny pup, she's 11 weeks old. They, you know, I took out the checkbook to, to, to pay for her. Um, she ran under a chair and the woman said, well, you can just reach in and pull her out. And I said, no, I'm not going to do that. So I, I got down on the floor prone, looking underneath the chair, having a conversation with her. She crawled out into my arms, picked her up, and I said, okay, now now we can go. I said, I'm not going to do that. And um, I, I rescued a dog from the streets, actually. Um, I love this dog terribly, so I have to be super careful how I talk about it. But um, he was abandoned, and it took me eight days to convince him to trust me. And people, everyone was trying to catch him. City of Seattle, you know, the whole nine yards. He's a beautiful German shepherd. And I love those dogs. I grew up with one. So I know them. And I went out and fed that dog. I roasted chicken for him. I just, you know, 
he'd wait for me. And it was getting to the point where he couldn't stay any longer. It was day eight. And I just put the bowls down. I brought my husband, Scott, and I said, sit over there. He doesn't know you. He's just a little farther away. And I put the bowls down, and he came running. I'm like, oh, thank God. And I, he came down, and I tossed a ball for him. And I saw him look at it and look at me, and he knew. I'm not here. I'm not going to try to rope you. And I said, look, dog, you're out of time. <laughs> you're out of time. you got to come with me. Please come with me. Follow me home, okay? He did. I picked up the bowls. He followed me. He was so nervous, so nervous. Um, sat down in the yard. Gate open. I'm not catching you. you got to decide to stay. And I put the bowls down. I sat down on the ground. My husband sat down a couple feet away from me. And he was doing this. He was so nervous. And I said, it's okay, buddy. And he came over. He put his head in my lap. And he rolled over for a belly rub. I looked at my husband and said, now he's my dog. Yeah, that's a great story. Thank you. Unfortunately, he passed away um, from cancer. Yeah. And we now have another dog. Yeah. And it's a German Shepherd that we got from uh, Washington State German Shepherd Rescue. So have you have you always had rescue dogs? Like, is this your little girl growing up or some? Okay. Yeah, I've never had a dog from a breeder. You know, just months that needed a home. Yeah, people don't realize for that. People don't dogs don't realize how much a dog becomes part of your family, right? Yep. Like yep. They're, they're, they're in your bed, the couch, like, yeah, it's. Yeah, they're totally, totally in your life. I mean, yeah. And and the dog, the second dog we have now came from Washington State German Shepherd, you know, rescue. And they will only give dogs to people that know the breed. And this one was really tough. Mm -hmm. He was five months old. We were his fifth dog. So it was a project. So next, let's talk about your role as an investor. Now, do you, you invest, I believe, in Seattle, do Seattle Angel Conference or Alliance of Angels? Or? No, no, I've actually really done most of my investing completely independently. Okay. Um, and usually through people that I know that start a company, quite okay. honestly. Um, I, I, is there a certain thing you invest in? I mean, obviously, I'm thinking tech, but is it like any certain like um, vertical? Um, tech is some. Mm -hmm. uh, media is one. And liquor is another. <laughs> oh, wow. That's interesting. <laughs> yeah. Um, we're... Uh, my husband, I made my husband do it because I wanted him to like have the experience of, of doing that. But uh, we're invested in a company called Brovo here, which uh, is a lady is run by a woman and she's, it's a distillery. And so she makes really great products. So how does one become an investor? Is like, do you have to have, make, make a certain amount of income? Can I, can I say I'm Jason Cabin's investor? Do you have to get certified? How does that, how does that work? You need to have, and the rules have just recently changed, so I'm not entirely sure what they what they are today. Um, they've loosened up, but there was an income threshold. You had to meet one of, of, of a couple of different, you don't have to have all of them, but you have to have enough investable income to qualify, and and that has to not include your house. Oh, so, wow. Yeah. yeah, so you have to, have, you have to <laughs> oh. be able to say you have cash and and or you have income of a certain level. And it's a pretty high level in order to just invest in startups or to invest through, let's say, Kuretsu, um, which Tom and I have been involved in as well. They and also and so you would be considered an angel investor? Yes. Okay. Yes. Yes. And then another one was a technology, um, was an application uh, for analysis that, that I knew the founder. And so they and, were raising a round and I put in some money. And how long have you been an angel investor? Um. My first angel investment was, gosh, before, gosh, before 2000, the year 2000, I want to say 95, oh, wow. six, a friend of mine started a company and I lent him the capital to get going. So what made you get interested in angel investing? Um, honestly, it was, it was, it was really a vote of confidence for the people that were starting it. You know, for me, it was investing in people. and. Yeah, I, that's really what it is. It's just investing in the person and believing in the in the what they've developed. So, do you do you take cold calls, cold emails? Do you do you want like an introduction from someone you know? How, how can people reach out to you? Um, for the, I'm for the investing piece. I would piece. say LinkedIn. Okay, is probably the best way. It and it um, it's really, once you're in a startup yourself, you've got a really good idea when you're hearing a pitch as to whether or not it's a good idea. And I've got a group of informal friends that I share uh, presentations mm. that, you know, comes my way. I'll, I'll 
send it over to my friend Bonnie, who's a, also a startup. Uh, she's a CEO of a startup. Um, and say, what do you think of this? So there's we share with each other, and there's also um, haven't been as involved lately, but groups like Koretsu Forum, mm -hmm. which will help do the due diligence. And That's a big piece, right? It's a huge piece, and you know we went and presented to Koretsu early early days. Some of our first money was raised through Koretsu. I cannot thank them enough, and I know you have to you have to pay a fee in order to be a presenting company. There have been many companies that I've known of that have said, I don't want to pay that. What if I don't get investment? Well, if, if you're good enough to pass through their screening process, you probably will get investment. So they screen you to make sure you're ready. They help you make sure your presentation is, is right. And then you do a pre-pitch, if you will, with their committee that makes choices. And then if you go forward, then you have to pay the fee. It's not just pay the fee. Um, you know what I mean? Like pay, take, pay $20,000 and talk to pitch some random people, you know, right. so it doesn't work like that. Right. It doesn't work like that. And so, you know, we were able to raise a significant amount of funding, our initial funding through Karatsu. We went through the process, you know, the pitch was made and they liked it and thank goodness they liked it. But that is, I learned so much from that because then of their members, they have to have someone volunteer to do the due diligence. And it's a group of people. And then what I was able to do years later was give back for a startup that needed someone to do due diligence for them. And I participated. So, you know, it's that lifelong learner, but it's also that give back. Can you talk about the points about founders getting out there and pitching their business, like going to Founders Live, going to these different pitch competitions, getting in front of people at the point of doing that? It is critically important. I just did one this week. Um, and I'm an advisor to a couple of startups. Uh, this one is particularly stealth. And um, because it's such a brilliant idea. It is someone I met over the years here in Seattle and, at another startup. He was at another startup. I was at this startup. And he asked me to be an advisor. I said, absolutely. He did the, did the pitch on Tuesday. And um, I have a whole series of notes for him. But what I really appreciated, you get feedback in the moment. You get feedback right away from, you know, their cadre of really qualified people. And the, the feedback was smart and was on the money. So I think that is critical. And I would say to this person with whom I'm working, you need to do this a couple more times before you get in front of investors. So there's definitely art to it, right? There's an art to it. You really should know it cold. You need to look into the camera. Look into the camera. Don't read your notes. You know, there's so many things that 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 have changed in terms of the way we're pitching right now because of COVID. Because yeah, that's a bit different pitching over Zoom and pitching in person. Like in person, you kind of get the vibe of the atmosphere, the chemistry. And Zoom is like looking at people and like you don't know. You can't read the room. You can't read the room in Zoom. You just can't. And it's really, really hard. So Yes, practice, practice, practice. No, hold. Know what you're going to say about every slide. Absolutely. Well, without looking back at the slide, right? Correct. Correct. You can't look, don't look down. I mean, I was on a panel with somebody on a, no less, in a panel. I mean, it's a conversation. And I watched this person read notes because you could see, you could see the person, here's the camera, and the person's doing this the whole time. That doesn't engage the audience. I have some tricks for that. And also too, you got to have a, like literally hundreds of pitches, right? You got to have a pitch each situation, right. each investor, you have a two minute pitch, five minute pitch on and on and on. And, and then you have to send a slide deck that you're going to send like through email. That'd be different from the deck you pitch in person. Correct. I would also recommend that you have deep dive slides in the appendix mm -hmm. because there may be someone in the room that says, well, you didn't cover. Oh, let me show you. Yeah. You know, you want to be ready for that. And then you want to practice not only with your own team, but you want to practice external. You have to practice external. So this has always been one of my pet peeves. I get you feedback on this. Like you go like a pitch competition, right? And it'll be three minutes, five slides, right? And they'll do three minutes, five slides. And always one person, you should have done this, should have done that, should have done that. Like he would do like 20 minutes, like 30 slides, all the stuff you wanted, right? Always kind of kind of be disingenuous, you know? Well, you know. I didn't have time to write you a short letter, so I wrote you a long one, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. I mean, that is the truth. You didn't, you didn't do it long enough 
we didn't practice it hard enough. Mm. We didn't make sure that every element was somehow squeezed into that three to five minutes. You just have to, it like anything that you're writing, you've got to go back and edit and edit and edit. And this is my word choice and making sure that, that you don't have necessarily have to have like a horribly crowded, ugly slide, mm. but your narrative has to tell the story. And your slides can tell elements of the story. So you've got to tell the overarching story. Okay. And if you don't, you won't, you lose. You won't win. What makes you say no to a potential investment? No understanding of the, of the potential exit. That sounds like it'd be a kind of a basic thing they should know, right? They should have at least a plan. Okay. And I can almost guarantee you that plan won't work. Out. <laughs> I mean, you know, it, it's, it's, there'll be pivots. There'll be problems and there may be, it may happen faster, but um, you know, you don't want to be a founder that says, Oh, the first opportunity I'm out of here, but <laughs> <laughs> that you don't want to see, but you definitely want to see um, you want to see that, that path forward of growth that is meaningful. And then you want to make sure that the founder understands what the possibilities for exit are mm -hmm. and can articulate them, who they are and why they might be interested. Because if angels don't care as much, venture cares. Mm -hmm. Venture wants to make sure they can get their money out in three to five years. And if you cannot articulate that and or they don't believe you, they won't invest in you. So two-part question. Of all the pitches you see people approach you for investment, what percentage do you actually talk to them? And then what percentage do you actually invest in? Oh, it's a very small number that I invest in. I mean, like less than a percent, probably. Mm -hmm. Very small number. Um, you know, I had the experience of seeing a company pitch that I thought, <clears throat> it's a great pitch. It sounds really good. I don't like something about it. I can't put my finger on it. There's something I'm uncomfortable about. And it really looked good on paper. And my co-founder and I talked about it, like, quite a bit. And it turned out that it was fraud. That it was fraudulent. Like this person has actually, you know, been prosecuted. Um, I gotta tell you, it sounded really good. I know what it was. It was it was sort of serial raising the same way that that made it seem odd to me. Um, sometimes it's just gut, you know. It, it yeah. Anyway. So next question. Um, for those of startup founder. Are you supposed to say, I'm Jason Kavnis, I'm publicly fundraising, tell everyone about it? Like, how does that work, right? Like, should you say, I, I, I start trying to say, I'm Jason Kavnis, I'm gonna fundraise now and tell everyone about it, it should be stealth? Oh my goodness, That's, that completely depends. Um, stealth is fairly unusual. You really wanna be out there, mm -hmm. you know, with your product, talking about it, um, getting, you know, talking to, Incubators, I think incubators are great and they really are helpful, especially if you only have a couple of employees and you're really still building the company. I, th I would recommend an accelerator to any, any startup founder. There are a number of them. Um, my experience with that is I'm actually doing one right now, which is a bit more of an advanced one. It's called plug and play. Yeah, plug and play ventures and they connect you to customers. They connect you, you know, they, they have you work through your presentation. Um, it's great. It's, it's really important. Stealth would be done if you have funding mm -hmm. that you have raised quietly and you've got a series of investors that understand what it is you're building and are supporting it. And one of the other reasons for stealth is you may have a day job and you're not quite <laughs> ready to, Probably a good reason. <laughs> right. You're not quite ready to go whole hog into it. I mean, no one's going to invest in you if you're doing something part-time. You need to be in it. You need to be in it. Investors want to see the commitment. If you, as, as a co-founder or founder, do not have that conviction, why should they? So for your deal flow, I think it's the right term, deal flow. Is that like the word of mouth for friends to bring deals to you? Or how do you get your deal flow? Um. There are times when we work with um, people in the industry that are licensed to help raise money. That's an option. 
um, accelerators are a great option, mm -hmm. and uh, they will network you through. A lot of public speaking opportunities, really important to seek those out, to have one of the founders or the founder or the CEO or me um, who's willing to go out and have many, many conversations that will help you raise funds. You can, you know, you can go the VC route. There are funds like Redpoint or houses like Redpoint that actually have a seed stage fund that will fund you. You need to do your homework, find out who is investing in your, your sector, and then connect to them. I will say you do need to have a, an actual introduction to, an, a, to a, a venture fund. Mm -hmm. You really do. You just, I think if you just show up, they might take the meeting, but they will probably not take it seriously. And having that introduction is worth its weight in gold. So as an investor, that's really, I mean, you know, you care. You care about who knows this person, what is that person's background, right? You just care. And as a venture firm, you also want to know that. So it's really important to bring on advisors and people that can make those introductions for you. And do your homework. If you're, you know, you've got a medical device, there are many, many firms that don't, don't invest in that, mostly because you need FDA clearance, it's really hard to get, you, you know. You want, want experts, you want people that understand your business and that don't, don't say things that, that like we got, which was, um, I don't think media is a big enough sector. That's a great point. Talk about the points of having a board of advisors as early as you can as a startup. Day three. You know, you, you got it laid out and you need to start finding people that can help frame what you're doing. Um, we have really great advisors as part of our team. And it also helps our development team. And this is something I think that people don't really understand. Your advisors don't just talk to your founders. They talk to the team. Mm -hmm. And they talk to the team in a way that helps the team develop. We have experts in film and that sort of thing. And our, our data scientists, our engineering team, knows they can reach right out to them and ask them questions. We have a, uh, somebody with a PhD in audience, which is also important because as we are building algorithms, we need to make sure that we're building the right thing, right? We're asking the right question. We developed it the right way. So that's all critical. I think like we talked about a solo founder before, I think a critical point if you're a solo founder, if you're a solo founder, you can say, hey, I don't have a co-founder yet, but I have these four advisors who believe in me. Yes. Yeah. And can help guide me. And help you find a co-founder, right. hopefully. Right. And, you know, work your way through the market, up to the marketplace, right? You, you need to, they're not going to be, and this is another thing, you, you know, they're going to help you. They're not going to work for you. Yeah. I, I learned that quickly, right? Yeah. Right. Right. You know, it, it's. That's the thing. If you if you rely too hard on your advisors to get stuff done, it's not going to happen. Yeah, but, you got to go there like you know very very spot on right, like very important questions, right? Right. Can't be like general generic yeah. stuff. Don't Has to be call something them every week. They're not. Know. That's not appropriate. Do keep them in the loop and a regularly scheduled you know call where it's for advisors and they are seeing um, developments and learning as you go. We put them in the, any investor communication that goes out includes our advisors always. And what should someone compensate their advisors? We use equity. Equity. Yeah. We use equity that, that best over time. So for you, on one hand, you're an investor. Other hand, you have your own startup. How do you balance these, like, seemingly two different responsibilities? My startup comes first. Okay. My job comes first. Um, I do what I can do on the advisory side, but it can't compromise, you know, my company. Um, I was asked to be on this call at five o'clock so I could view the founder of this company I'm advising um, presenting. Well, that's, that's, I can make that time. You know, if you're asking for a great deal of my time during the day, I can't do that. The other thing I won't do is when I'm raising funds, I will, I can't refer somebody else in, mm -hmm. you know, that's hurts my head and doesn't make sense. And, you know, I think there's an expectation sometimes that you'll just get us investors. You, the founders really need to do that. Asking advisors to do that is not the best approach. Okay. They can introduce. They yeah, can introductions, help. yeah. Right. And I'm happy to do that, but I won't um I won't go farther than that. So we, we talked about your company some already, but you, can you go more detail 
uh, how, how it started, why you started it, where is that at right now, and what the, what's your future plans for your company? Um, yes. So it's we've been around for a few years in this, um, I'm going to say iteration. <laughs> you heard that. Um, we are at this point, we're doing a number of strategic partnerships that and channel sales that, that are really going to help move us forward, jettison us forward. We are through our build stage, I would say, um, and we're looking to create via a, a SaaS model, a sustainable revenue, and really sustainable revenue, big revenue. And that, that's where we are now, just bringing on additional salespeople and um, marketing prowess and focused on build brand building and really getting the company to the point where it's very well known and it's in this industry that we've created. So that's where we are. I would say we're done with um, non-recurring en engineering, NRE. We're done with beta. And because that's where we've been for years. This is a really intense build. I mean, if you really have machine learning applied to video, millions and millions and millions of dollars to do that, right? It, it's, just, it's just a lot of time to build what we built. We're done with that. Now we're refining. We'll never be finished. But we're really refining and iterating on that, advancing. I would say the platform's really powerful. So, self care is a big thing. How do you take care of yourself? I don't do a really good job. <laughs> um, I mean, I you know, I I have my dogs that I care for. I mean, I love gourmet cooking. I love baking. I do a lot of that. That's something you can do easily during COVID. <laughs> so I do a lot of it and feed my neighborhood. Not even kidding. Like cookies, cakes, whatever. I take it everywhere. I'm not going to eat it all. Um, so I do a lot of that. Um, you know, I used to do a lot of wildlife photography and travel, which I adore. Um, you know, you can't do that now. My yard looks fantastic. <laughs> fantastic. I actually have 42 roses. It's crazy. So you have a lot going on, you know, everything you're doing. How do you schedule your day? Like, do you have like a calendar you use? Do you have certain tools? Or you just wake up in the morning and wing it? I don't wing anything. Absolutely everything is calendar. Everything is calendar. Um, you're right. I have a lot of competing responsibilities and a lot of just a lot to do. You're right. Um, I will tell you, I'm never bored and I'm always busy. I always have something I'm doing. Always. There's never really this, oh, I have nothing to do today feeling. Yeah, yeah that never happens. It never happens. Never happens at all. Um, I like it that way. I like being busy. I like working hard. I got off the phone. Eight o'clock the day before, yesterday, yesterday, I got off the phone at 7.05, you know, Zoom or whatever, Teams. Um, so it's a, these are long days. And self-care for me, actually now, I'm not looking at my email ever when I'm doing something else. Mm -hmm. I just had to stop that. The, the amount of email is overwhelming. And I think it's because people are home and, you know, emailing is a good way to communicate. And so I'm getting constant, constant barrages of email. And I just finally thought, I'm just going to stop. And then after work or at lunch, I'll scroll through it, see if there's anything important. And if not, I'll just wait till later and I'll just respond then. But I don't, I don't, have, I don't feel the pressure. I have to respond in the moment anymore. Do you have any favorite tools that you use, like to increase product productivity? Um, well, we use Asana, which is excellent. Yeah, I'm a big Asana fan. I'm, a, I'm an Asana groupie. Yeah, love Asana. Love Asana. I mean, it, it's excellent. Uh, we use Slack, um, which I like very much, although now I have four channels, soon to be five, uh, which is a bit crazy. But you know, if, you, if you link them all together, you can <laughs> see on the side, you, you don't get lost. Um, I use, for personal, I use Todoist. Um, I like that a lot. Um, I do keep personal separate. And it's on my phone. It's on my laptop. I can see it easily. Um, that's and I use obviously my Google Calendar, and that's really what I use. And I live and die by it. So some entrepreneurs like you know, Elon Musk famously works out hundred hours a week. Others work forty hours. I have a friend he works like twenty one days in a row. Takes two days off. Other people like work every day. What what do you usually do? What's your schedule like? Um, I work a lot, but I what I try to do. I stop at, I don't know, six, seven, whatever, 
think about dinner, make dinner. I'll watch some television with my husband. He actually is a, he goes to bed early. And so I spend the rest of the evening with him until 12 or 1. Okay. I just admit that. It, I know it's not great, but it's it works for me. Because then I get a break to do something with the family, play with the dogs, whatever. And then I can come right back to it, and it's quiet. And I can just get a lot of work done. And your company, is it headquartered in Seattle or Bellevue? Seattle. Seattle, okay. Um, is there anything I should have asked you that I, haven't, that I did not ask you? Gosh, I don't think so. I don't think so. This is a great conversation. Cool. Um, can you share your social media links so people reach out to you? Um, yes. Uh, LinkedIn is under Arm and Car. You can just find link very easily. And um, Twitter is at Randa M, as in Mary, number two. Those are the primary ones I use. Um, I do keep Facebook as something completely separate okay. and Instagram the same. Okay. Um, I just, and really the only things and no one will care. It's the only things I post are, are cakes, cookies, food, and my <laughs> dogs. Pretty much. That's it. Sounds like a great Instagram post right there. <laughs> I, I, I love Instagram. It's, it's super fun. And for our listener, we have the link to our social media on our show notes. You can find our show notes at www.cabinetstallblog.com. And don't forget to support, to support our crowdfunding campaign at HTTPS. CameronSHR.co fast crowdfunding. So what kind of end of our talk? Can you give us advice on wisdom? Anything you want to talk about? Life is really short. I learned that the hard way. And, you know, do the things you love and only do the things you love and tell the people that you love that you love them and make time to go see people. I'm excited about the country opening back up and my ability to go see friends and family that I have not seen for a long time. And I think as entrepreneurs and as, you know, startup folks, we forget that. But make that happen. Make it happen. Because at the end of the day, it's the only thing that matters. And don't have any, don't, don't have regrets. Don't, you know, I lost my dad. I told you that at the beginning of this, um, at the end of January. Very, very hard for me. But I talked to him every day he was by himself in Ohio and I couldn't go see him. I'm glad for that. I'm glad that no matter how busy I was, I called my dad every day. That's great. I agree with you. Once this is over with, I think there's been a travel boom. I'm seeing this nation's history, right? Right. There's going to be a nation, uh, there's no travel boom is going to be off the, off the wall. Yeah. You're not going to be able to see me. I mean, no way. So thank you for your time today. I really appreciate it. And thanks for everything you're doing for startups here in Seattle and across the nation. You're welcome. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. And to our listeners, thank you for your time as well. Remember to be great every day.